What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? It's your boy Kevin to turn on this motherfucking YouTube shit. Shit, man. Out your gang, man. Out your north side, man. Hood shit, man. Hey, man, say, man. Um, free Palestine, free Congo, Russia, do your thing. Texas, stand the fuck up, man. Hey, man, say, man. Each day is a new day to be a better version of yourself, man. Hey, go hard, put the work in. Don't sell your source short, nigga. Go hard every day, put the work in, man. Hey, they said, man, if you ain't never took an L in your life, man, you ain't really trying hard, man. So no matter what happens, nigga, if you take an L, nigga, hey, that's just because you put that work in. You know what I'm saying? A lot of niggas not gonna do that. They gonna take what they what they give to them. Less effort, you know what I'm saying? They ain't take L, but it's called less effort. You know what I'm saying? Not giving out the real, you know? They gonna try whatever they can. A lot of niggas, lot of these, lot of these days not gonna speak on the real, man. And that's just the truth, man. And we just gotta accept that shit, man. They, they wanna act like you, be like you, but don't wanna, don't wanna promote the shit. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, we got our own lives of destiny, my destiny, man. Hey, yeah. But at the end of the day, man, I hope y'all enjoyed this um, video. Keep Yahweh first, man, cause at the end of the day, man, when everybody give up on you, man, Hey, for real, you did. But uh, come to the black kid from Israelite, man, as a real Jew, man. You know what I'm saying? As a real one, man. A lot of niggas not finna claim that shit like me. A lot of niggas not finna pop that shit like me. You know what I'm saying? Because it ain't me. So at the end of the day, man, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. Let's get into this bitch. All right. Boom. Today, two motherfucking day, straight hood outside, big crib shit, man. Hey, man, send me out chair in the king. All right, man. So we finna talk about this shit, man. Um... You know, this is a this is gonna be about a black national actor game. You know what I'm saying? Who used to act um, back in the day? You know what I'm saying? Um, when you know it was time when black celebrities really wasn't like popping and shit, and they really wasn't giving niggas chances to win. Um, I, I'll be y'all. Y'all probably already know who I'm talking about. They call a nigga Red Fox, nigga. You know what I'm saying? Fred Fox, nigga. But y'all, his name Fred Sanford, nigga. Um, one of the goats, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, I ain't never watched that nigga as a kid, cause I wasn't alive. You did? <laughs> I'm born in the 90s, close to 2000s. You know what I'm saying? That nigga right there, bro. Co comedian, legend, black actor, activist, goat, nigga. Just hands down. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I'm not. I'm not saying his. His, him as a as a person behind the scenes and shit we don't know about because hey that's two different things. But as far as what he did for the community, he did a, he did a positive shit for the community, man. And you know it's unfortunate, man. You get and sometimes, man, you get put to a position, man, where the white man drags you, man. You know what I'm saying? And you get to a position where you you get you make so much money on, but it's like you know we can't blame it all on the, the other opposition, but it's like you know. He, he made horrible mistakes, man, in his life three, man, to where, you know, he, it came to where it happened. So we got a video about his lifestyle and what happened to him. And his, his famous show that I remember mostly from is Sanford, Sanford and Son. You know what I'm saying? I'm, man, like, you know, I, you know watching him um, as I got a little bit older, not because like, I didn't watch him as a kid like that, you know what I'm saying? But as I got older, I, I, I found out about him. Hey. And legit, he legit funny, man. He, he talks some real shit. And, and real shit happens to real niggas. So, hey, man, at the end of the day, man, we gonna uh, put the video in. I hope y'all enjoy it, man. And shout out to the people I got the video from. Hey, man, say, man. Turn up, turn up, turn up. Boy, Kevin, to turn on this bit. Hey, so this like um uh, Red Fox. What is it? Fred and Sanford? Man, this used to be a good ass TV show. I I wasn't I didn't grow up, of course, watching this shit, but you know, later on, you know, you look at you gotta look at the old good black classical um TV shows. And this was a really good, funny TV show that 
Man, I didn't know it, was, it went this crazy. The tragic death of Red Fox. No, I want my money. I say, I said, no, I got to get out of here. Uh -oh. I think I've seen I this show. Not like this, this uh, episode. I've never had things like this before. This is a fu oh, he's funny, bro. I've never had, son. Oh, it's the worst you know one. This is a big one. I'm dying. <laughs> I know he, I know he ended up being broke. Red Fox had one of the most tragic careers in show business. He broke barriers as the first major African American TV star, paving the way for legends like Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy, who mm. he inspired. And despite all his talent and his impressive career, Hollywood never paid Red the respect he deserved. Crazy. Hollywood literally worked Red to death. In a bizarre what they twist do, of man, fate, use you the up. man famous for faking heart attacks on set would end up dying of a heart attack on set. That's it gonna be in this house. I didn't even know that. That's it gonna be here. Elizabeth, I'm coming, honey. I know I'm coming this time. I can see my tombstone. As he lay there dying, everyone laughed as they thought he was doing yet another one of his signature pranks. But unfortunately, this time it was real. One of America's favorite comedians has died. Red Fox collapsed last night during a rehearsal of his new comedy series. And even in death, Fox did not get the respect he deserved. A legend. Moments after hearing of his passing, the producers were more upset about having to rewrite the script than they were at the death of a comedy legend. Even this heathen deserved to live. Start to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. <laughs> I'd rather wipe the fingerprints off. <laughs> we will reveal the events leading up to his sudden mm. passing and explain why Fox was so full of anger in his final moments before clutching his heart and collapsing. Despite making over $100 million in his illustrious career, Damn. he died penniless and broke. Telephone, final notice. What's with all these final notices? Pop, haven't you been paying the bills? Nope. <laughs> well, the bills come on time, don't they? Yeah, the bills come on time, but there's been a slight delay in the money. Fox went from rags to riches, and then back to rags again. Damn. He made millions playing a TV junk salesman. So why is Red Fox broke? The government has taken everything he owned. It was a sad end to a sad life. Most great comedians have Damn. great faults. And Fox was no different. We also cover his many faults. Throughout his life, he struggled with a reckless lifestyle, even doing substances on the set of Sanford and Son. Huh? Oh, you can do anything you want, as long as they're legal. Uh, well, I'll put it back. <laughs> he had very volatile personal relationships, not only with producers, but also with his own family. Shout out to this we will reveal man. all of this uh, and more in this video. Making this video. John Elroy Sanford was born on December 9th, Damn, 1922, born in the impoverished inner city neighborhood known as St. Louis's Mill Creek Valley. His father, Fred, an occasional electrician, abandoned the family when Red was only around three years old, leaving his mother, Mary, overwhelmed, trying to provide for Red and his older brother, Fred Jr. As a maid, Mary worked long, exhausting hours for white families just to scrape by. Damn. Fox used to go around searching in trash cans for food to eat. People say poor, but I, we were I felt that. poor. P O O O O O O O O O O O R. So poor that poor, poor people talked about us. <laughs> Damn, fact. I felt that. That's With his real. mother constantly working, young Red was left in the care of his grandmother, Elvia Hall. Formerly enslaved, Grandma Hall was nearly full-blooded Native American. She did her best to raise Red and Fred Jr. in the Native extremely American cramped black. living conditions. At one point, a total of five families were crammed together in a tiny wooden shack. As a young boy, Red endured cruel taunts from neighborhood kids, as his mixed-race heritage gave him an unusually light complexion compared to other black youths. This discrimination took its toll leading Red to often feel like an outsider. The lonely Red began seeking solace through comedy and dreaming up elaborate pranks on classmates. 
after getting expelled from fifth grade for injuring another student, Red had ample idle not, time wandering the streets. I'm not the darkest nigga in the world. He started I've never working that, around the that local trouble. black theater called the Plantation House, becoming enthralled by the racy, raw comedy they, they of traveling up. black you performers dark, on stage. They talk shit. Red crazy, meticulously man. practiced their lewd jokes and wild antics late into the it, night you know back at home. As a young teen in the early 1930s, Red tapped into his natural knack for humor to earn money dancing and singing corny jokes on street corners with his best friend. But Red yearned for more. At age 16 in 1938, he and two partners hatched a plan to sneak onto a freight train headed for New York City hey, make them to money chase fame and stardom. Facts. While his friends were quickly arrested in a rail yard, Red managed to evade capture and rode the rails alone all the way to Harlem. Damn! Arriving with only a happen. few coins in his pocket, Red My immersed himself in the vibrant love. jazz scene blossoming in 1940s Harlem. Not he took odd jobs me. like washing dishes at Jimmy's Chicken Shack just to get by. One co-worker there was Malcolm Little, who would later become known as Malcolm X. The two young men bonded over their impoverished backgrounds and turned to petty theft and selling weed to survive. To avoid being drafted in World War II, Fox ate half a bar of soap before his physical. This resulted in him having heart palpitations, which allowed him to dodge service. Fox's career really mm. took off when he teamed up with fellow comedian Slappy White in Harlem in 1947. Together, they broke from tradition as one of the first black comedy duos not conforming to outdated stereotypes. They performed frequently at the Apollo Theater and at black nightclubs nationwide. They were paid $40 a night. That's pretty good back in the day. they weren't always paid and were often screwed over. As a result, Red would insist on being What if I can't make the game because of a baby? With cash up front for the rest of his life, even on Sanford and Son, he insisted on getting payments in cash. Damn. This early experience of getting fleeced never left him. You see if the money's still in there. <laughs> I ain't gonna make it. You hear that, Elizabeth? I'm coming to join you, honey. Rich. Conditions were often demanding, but this gave Red Stage experience regardless. Here he took on the sharp stage. I bet it was her Red Roy Fox. too, though. You know what I'm saying? He got There's a lot multiple of shit for free, explanations you know? for how he came up with this name. I like the way your name has. You have two D's at the end of Red and two X's at the end of Fox. Keeps me from being an animal. Red. Oh. See what I mean? It's a name rather than, you know, representing an yeah. animal. One is that the name Fox was a tribute to Chicago Cubs player Jimmy Fox. Another is that he was nicknamed Fox for his foxy personality, meaning he was well-dressed and appealing to women. The red part came from his childhood nickname Red, which referred to his reddish hair. He spelled Red with two Ds and Fox with two Xs, so that his name stuck out when written down. Big Red Fox, smile! I love it. I love the way he spelled his name with two Ds and two Xs. I wonder why he does that. I don't know why he used the two Ds, but I saw his nightclub back once. And I know why they got all them Xs. <laughs> While success was growing, Red fought constantly with his first comedy partner, Slappy White. Similar upbringings yet clashing egos lead to bitter resentment. After splitting from Slappy, a demoralized Red even considered quitting show business. But through grit and sheer determination, yeah, I ain't that, I he ain't persevered, that, he had, that never forgetting that his before. painful I early struggles. With the, with the young kid. Red went solo as a stand-up comedian out west. His raunchy comedy pushed boundaries drawing from real-life stories that mainstream audiences weren't used to hearing. He became a huge hit on the L.A. club circuit in the 1950s. This led to a recording contract with the Doto label and then Frank Sinatra's reprise records. I had to play small clubs in Mississippi. While he was singing and dancing with the Klan, I was running from it. <laughs> Fox released hit comedy albums throughout you know, the late they, 1950s it's funny when it's super with raunchy real, you know routines that shocked some listeners but made him an underground sensation across black America. In the 1960s, as his fame rose, 
Red broke barriers as one of the first black comics playing major venues like Las Vegas. Fox became one of the highest paid entertainers on the Las Vegas Strip. Casino owners recognized his talent for connecting with audiences. By the end of the 1960s, Fox was earning up to $10,000 a week in Vegas. Around this same time, he got a small but memorable role in the film, Cotton Comes to Harlem. As one of the best stand-up comics working, he longed to cross over to TV and film. His edgy reputation made that challenging. His big break came when producer Norman Lear caught his act in Vegas. We loved uh, Red Fox. And he'd he seen him at a nightclub? He was no, a nightclub. I've seen him often at a nightclub, yeah. With an act that was laced with profanity. He could walk into a room and tell you, your mother died and make you laugh. Damn. I mean, his earlobes were funny. Red Fox was just funny. Lear instantly knew Red would be perfect for an upcoming sitcom pilot script titled Sanford and Son. Okay, Sanford Though and Son. The networks were hesitant due to Fox's controversial image. The pilot was a smash hit. Feels like a dream. As cantankerous junk dealer Fred Sanford, Red quickly became a household name. Sanford and Son soared to the top of ratings charts from 1972 to 1977. At its peak, over 30 million people tuned in weekly, making it among TV's most watched shows. Its ratings rivaled hits like All in the Family. Hey, that, I don't get As one of TV's Sanford first Son black family funny. sitcoms, the success of Sanford and Son ushered in a wave of black sitcoms and establishing Red Fox as an unlikely TV legend after breaking color barriers. And Fox was essential in helping shape Sanford and Son with his humor and often ad-lib dialogue. That's, that's why I called the hospital. Well, I got here as fast as I could. You know, you look kind of young to be a doctor. You sure you're a doctor? No, I'm in residence, sir, but I will be a doctor in six months. Well, I can't wait that long. On screen, Fred Sanford's money-making schemes gone awry provided endless fodder for laughs. Red's reactions, mannerisms, and flawless comedic timing made the blue-collar character an American favorite. But behind the scenes, tensions also brewed over money. Fox complained he was getting unfairly paid $10,000 per episode compared to the white stars of All in the Family, who were getting paid $30,000 per episode. As a result, he refused to show up for work until his payment demands were met. The producers gave in and bumped up Fox's pay to $25,000 per episode, giving him $5,000 for each rerun and 25% of the producers' profits. All of they this was that, to be bro. paid pay tax-free and in cash, and different races, more money adjusted on the for people. inflation. Today. This $25,000 per episode is worth roughly $142,000 in today's money. This should have left Fox set for life. And he thought that being paid in cash would mean that the IRS would not be able to track the money and Damn. tax him. But this would end up in disaster, as we will discuss later on. And despite being paid so much, by 1977... Fox had grew complacent. Tired of the constant arguments, he abruptly quit the show at the height of its popularity. So, Red is dead. Fox was always a big gambler, and he took a massive gamble by quitting Sanford and Son. He thought he could capitalize on his fame and move on to bigger things. As a result of his Sanford and Son fame, Fox soon got an ABC variety series in 1977 called the Red Fox Comedy Hour. With a lucrative contract, the show represented a chance for Fox to showcase his talents on his own terms. However, by 1978, plummeting ratings led to swift cancellation, a huge professional setback. Fox's comeback efforts on TV faltered throughout the late 1970s and 80s. A reboot of Sanford and Son was quickly canceled. An attempt with ABC at a new sitcom Damn. also failed rapidly. Fox's big gamble on his career had failed. Damn. I've been away from television two or three years and no one's called me to do anything. I guess they think that I'm just Fred Sanford and so if they don't have a part for Fred, there's nothing else left, so... Outside of his career, his personal life was in disarray too. Part of the reason Fox had fought so hard for more money on Sanford and Son was because he had serious financial problems as a result of his extravagant lifestyle. 
One of the reasons for his financial problems was his substance use throughout his life. From early on in his life, when he bonded with Malcolm Little, later known as Malcolm X, they consumed substances and were involved in theft. Substance use would play a recurring role in Red Fox's life. As his fame rose during the 1950s and 60s through stand-up comedy, his lifestyle grew increasingly volatile, fueled by growing drug and alcohol habits. By the height of his Sanford and Son TV fame in the mid-1970s, Red was a fixture in Vegas, drinking heavily and doing coke openly. Mm. He would even use these substances yeah, in the sugar. studio dressing room in the open during rehearsals. Uh, you want a shot of something? <laughs> By the 1980s, without the structure of steady work, his substance use spiraled severely out of control. He surrounded himself with hangers-on who enabled his lifestyle. The substance use affected his relationships greatly. Those around him found Fox to be ill-tempered and aggressive. He was famous for being volatile on sets with producers, but this volatility was present in his personal life too. Red Fox's real-life relationships often mirrored the confrontational, isolated, and selfish nature of his iconic Fred Sanford character. He consistently followed his own path regardless of consequences, which likely took a severe toll on those closest to him throughout his tumultuous life. His erratic and aggressive behavior led to multiple marriages breaking down. He was married a total of four times. Damn. His first wife was Evelyn Kilbrew, Fun whom time. he impulsively married only five days after meeting in 1944. This teenage romance didn't last long. His second and longest marriage was to dancer Betty Jean Harris, lasting 19 Man, years like before divorcing to, to bitterly in 1976 amidst rumors of Fox's cheating. Mm. How many times have you been married now? Let's see. That nigga like he's in the candy shop, nigga. <laughs> but hey, that's life. Their stormy relationship ruptured as his career took off due to Fox's erratic behavior. His younger Korean wife, Joy, divorced him in 1982 due to his alleged aggressive behavior. Fox was known to start off acting lovingly in relationships, but this was soon followed by possessiveness, paranoia, and irrational rages. This behavior only got worse as Fox became more famous. However, Fox could also demonstrate great warmth at times. He mentored many young black entertainers and adopted his second wife's daughter. After he found out his long-term friend Della Reese was unemployed, Fox pretended to have a back injury so that she could take his job. He was my friend for at least 40 years. We were hungry together, but I went to see him. He said, what you doing, D? I said, I'm not doing anything. I'm looking for a job. He called the man who he was working for. He said, I don't think I'm going to be able to go on. My back is out. And I and he's standing there like he can't straighten up. Ain't nothing wrong with him. He said, my back is out, but Della Reese is here. And the man hired me. This story highlights how Fox was a very complicated person with a volatile side, but also with a generous and caring side. His generous side, however, got himself into trouble with the U.S. government. Having grown up in extreme poverty, Red enjoyed his wealth and lived a life of luxury. He was very generous to himself and those around him when it came to money. By the mid-1970s, he was among TV's highest paid stars on Sanford and Son, getting over $25,000 per episode from NBC, along with extravagant perks like payment only in cash. With millions pouring in from the smash hit show, as well as films, nightclub acts, and more, Red spent money recklessly on gambling, an excessive entourage of hangers-on, expensive gifts, and living out his show business dreams to the extreme. Have you messed up money? I don't think I messed it up, but I gave a lot of it away to people. You know what I mean? I'm just a soft touch. Despite earning so much money, Fox always seemed to have money problems due to his uncontrolled spending habits. Money flowed out as fast as it flowed in. One of his biggest expenses was frequent gambling trips to Las Vegas, where Las lengthy Vegas casino sessions resulted in large losses. When Sanford and Son ended its successful run, so did the peak of Red's earning power. But his spending only intensified, spending it on substances, girlfriends, 
a lavish Los Angeles nightclub venture, and later, an extravagant Vegas mansion. By the early 1980s, his out-of-control spending and lack of financial planning caught up with him. A large divorce only added to his problems. After closing his failing production company in 1983, he filed for bankruptcy. Damn. However, Fox continued to live lavishly while ignoring his A lot of people are falling for bankruptcy He refused these days. to send in checks with his tax returns and refused to pay taxes he legally owed. We don't intend to pay any income tax this year. Oh, well, then you'll go to jail. One guitar, six dollars. <laughs> he claimed that he would only start paying his taxes once there was a black president. Red hoped his fame would Damn, shield him from IRS prosecution, <laughs> despite refusing to pay back millions owed in taxes. But in 1989, the fantasy ended abruptly when federal agents raided his Vegas home. So why is Red Fox broke? The government has taken everything he owns. Now he's charging racial discrimination. They stripped him of his flashy jewelry as he watched helplessly. The press memorialized his shattered pride and ego laid bare with photos that shocked America. A stunning fall for someone once among Hollywood's highest flyers. Fox became increasingly isolated In professionally taxes, and man. financially. According to the IRS, Fox owed almost $3 million in back taxes by the late 1980s. Damn bad, As a result, how much he made. the government confiscated nearly all his belongings, wiping his house clean to help settle the massive debt. Fox was forced to strike a deal with the IRS to pay just 10 cents on every dollar owed. This allowed him to work again and rebuild his career. However, Fox's financial problems remained for the rest of his life, and even after his passing. John Witherspoon told a story that perfectly yeah. encapsulates Red's recklessness when it came to his finances. After the IRS took everything from Fox's house, he was worried that his club would be forced to close down, so he pleaded with Frank Sinatra for help. I took everything I own. I worked so hard to be who I am. I didn't do not just I own Texas, it ain't that bad. They, they, they took everything. Sinatra and Sammy Davis agreed to perform at Fox's club multiple times, and they raised enough money so that Fox could pay off his taxes. Red thanked them and said he would pay back the taxes. Don't have it to everybody. It's, oh my God, I want to thank you for doing with this for me. Oh, please, just take my take my 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 hug. Let me just hug you, hugging everybody. So they all went on their separate ways. Red Fox still didn't pay his taxes. No. <laughs> Red Fox could have won a billion dollars, and he probably still would have ended up broke due to how financially irresponsible Damn. he was. What am I going to do with all these bills? I tell you what to do with them. Put them back in the mailbox. <laughs> well, that's brilliant, Pop. Yeah. How'd you ever think of that? Yeah. That's like that song. Like, this irresponsibility my dad, with finances my dad and led to those around him but losing their patience. Demon Wilson, who Jeez. played Red's son in Sanford and Son, recently stated that he had no empathy for Fox's financial issues, stating they were all self-inflicted. When you don't do what you're supposed to do, I have no sympathy or empathy for you. At Are you wasting? At all. Red would file, but he, but, but he never, ever paid. And they called him down to the IRS offices. But why? And he performed, and not in a nice, kind way. So why would I feel anything for that? That was his fault. He did that to himself. The financial instability Fox experienced, despite earning millions at his peak, serves as a cautionary tale. No matter how much money he made, his prolific spending, gambling losses, messy divorces, bankruptcy, and tax debts meant Fox seemed to always be in hot water. Most of his career was overshadowed by reckless excess and financial mismanagement. Towards the end of his life, however, he did find some stability with a career resurgence. In 1989, Fox was cast in the film Harlem Nights, alongside comedy legends say, when you Richard blessed, Pryor and Eddie Murphy, and you who were both inspired like in, by like Fox. Black Hollywood, you can make money on that. Quick as hell. Years of excessive drinking and substances had taken a toll on his health. But his scene-stealing role reignited interest, despite having fallen completely out of the limelight. After getting his career back on track, Fox's tax issues appeared resolved. However, some claim he still engaged in tax avoidance schemes, 
like not declaring $500,000 earned from Harlem Knights. Apparently, his defiant nature when dealing with the IRS never changed. That is As Fox crazy. would simply throw tax bills in the trash. After Harlem Nights led to renewed focus on Fox, he was offered a role in a CBS sitcom, The Royal Family, in Told 1991. <laughs> Bro, the ratings crazy. for the show were extremely high, and the future seemed bright. I told you, bright. Black Royalty, you can make that Red money Fox back. Red Fox was experiencing Quickening a career quick. resurgence after years of financial and personal troubles. But it would not last. You know what I'm saying? On October 11th, 1991, less than a month after the show launched, disaster would strike. On this day, there were ongoing tensions on the TV set between Fox and one of the producers of the royal family, according to Red Fox's friend and co-star Della Reese's eyewitness account. The producer frequently tried to give Fox advice on being funny, which frustrated <laughs> Fox as he felt the producer knew nothing about comedy. They were not filming a scene, but instead they were only rehearsing. Fox was not needed as he had no lines, and his only part in the scene was him simply walking across the back of the set. As a result, Fox was away being interviewed by Entertainment Tonight, while the rest of the crew rehearsed. But the producer, who always argued with Fox, was not happy about him not being on set. So the producer walked over and rudely interrupted Red's Entertainment Tonight interview and told him to come back on the set. When Red returned to the set and saw he had no lines and his only role was to walk in the background, he was furious. Fox then suddenly clutched his heart and collapsed onto the floor. Initially, everyone laughed as they thought it was another one of Red's signature comedic pratfalls. In fact, Fox had even faked a heart attack earlier in that week's rehearsals. Oh, okay, damn. But quickly it became clear this was no stunt. Fox was not getting back up. Reese knelt next to Red to check in on him, and Red pleaded with her. On the floor, and I leaned down to him, and I put my hands on him. He said, get my wife, get my wife, get my wife. Reese yelled for someone to get Fox's wife and call paramedics. Soon after, Fox was pronounced dead on set and taken away in an ambulance, with the cast and crew following to the hospital. At the hospital... The doctor told Fox's wife that they had done all they could, but her husband was gone. Mm. Shockingly, just moments after hearing this devastating news of Fox's passing in the hospital, the producers were overheard complaining that they were now going to have to rewrite the script. The doctor comes out and says, uh, Mrs. Fox, we've done all that we can do. And all that about rewriting the script is insane. And standing this close were two of the producers and they said what are we going to do with the script this brazen they don't care nothing about you but your talent and your money out there lashed out at the producers before leaving she refused to continue anyone with ten thousand dollars treat both her co-star and his grieving wife so disrespectfully that's wrong reese laments that fox was not properly phased out of the ongoing storyline but simply replaced without a second thought by another actress within Damn. hours of his tragic end. Red Fox was disrespected his entire life Where by Hollywood. And even in his final moments and after his passing, he continued to be disrespected by Hollywood. What but outside do, of Hollywood, many respected Red Fox greatly. The white people do, Lots man. of comedians you, you who were inspired by Fox paid their respects including Eddie Murphy, who paid for Fox's funeral. The reason Jamie Fox has the last name Fox is in respect to Red Fox, who oh, inspired yeah. him. In death, however, Red's finances continued to be chaotic. Whatever money he had belonged to the IRS. Despite Fox earning over $100 million in his career, he effectively died broke. But most importantly, the comedy community lost an innovator who broke color barriers and took creative risks few would dare. The bizarre irony that Fox perished in such a poetic way, in the middle of acting out a fictional TV heart attack, something he'd playfully pantomimed a thousand times before as Fred Sanford, only added to the sadness. In retrospect, Fox's health struggles, substance use and high-stress lifestyle clearly took their toll. But his passing was still unexpected, 
as just weeks earlier, he had begun appearing on a hit television show for the first time in decades. Even though his career resurgence was cut short, Fox's impact on comedy was monumental. He had achieved immortality with several generations of fans. Few entertainers can boast the pioneering legacy Red Fox left on American comedy. Mm. His rags to riches story epitomized achieving one's wildest dreams through perseverance. From desperate poverty in St. Louis to rubbing elbows with hoodlums in 1940s Harlem, to becoming among TV's highest paid in 1970s Hollywood, Red lived one of entertainment's most improbable lives. Despite his early controversial image, Red showed that through comedy, people of all backgrounds could relate to common human experiences, and that even the most marginalized voices could transcend to achieve mainstream success by staying true to oneself. As sitcom star Fred Sanford, Red was the first black actor in decades leading a hit TV show. In the process, he spawned a more authentic portrayal of African-American family dynamics and humanized the African-American experience through insightful humor to mainstream audiences, paving the way for many African-American comics who followed, including legends like Richard Pryor. Behind the scenes, Red advocated tirelessly for other struggling black entertainers. He boosted comedians like Sandra Bernhard and Paul Mooney early on by featuring them in his shows. Decades later, icons from Dave Chappelle to Kevin Hart consistently cite him as an idol and inspiration. The depths of abandonment, discrimination, extreme poverty, like and King fending and that for bit, himself right, that Red endured in early life served as fuel rather than hindering his comedic talents. The pain of these early experiences poured through in Red's sensational storytelling and fearless pioneering brand of comedy. The very struggles that once threatened to define him became the fuel for his pioneering spirit in comedy. There will never be another Red Fox. Rest in peace. Mm. Shout out, shout out. I'll be back. So yeah, man, say man, say man, say man. It's sad, man. You know, you get to a position, man, that most niggas would die for. Most niggas would even could, could, couldn't even dream and imagine they self getting to that to position. You know what I'm saying? And you know, you you in a league, you in a class where a lot of motherfucking lot of black Americans and niggas not getting to that position. You know what I'm saying? Back in that day, anyway, it wasn't getting that to that position. You know what I'm saying? And you know, when coming when you come when you come to when you come at a position where you're different from everybody else, you have a target on your back. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, sometimes, man, it was between him and the casting people. And maybe the people made the shit. It egos, man. You know what I'm saying? When you feel like you the star, nigga, and you doing that shit, nigga, you make this role, nigga. But who cares? They might write the shit, but I make the shit. And I put my own little bit of sauce in that shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, how can you try to tell me how to do what I do best? I'm the nigga who did the shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nigga who changing the scenery, changing up shit. You know what I'm saying? You don't have a child tell me how to do my shit. You know what I'm saying? It's just like shit like that. You know what I'm saying? You always put your foot down, man. And show these niggas like, nah, hey, I put the work in. You know what I'm saying? A lot of niggas ain't put that work in. You know what I'm saying? I'm different. You know what I'm saying? You dig what I'm saying? And you know, when you, when you in that type of style, man, everybody got their own ego, man. And you know, you don't try to have no ego. It's always humble. You know what I'm saying? But the truth, the truth is the truth. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, all, all that arrogant shit aside, that pride shit. When you, when it's the truth, it's the truth. You dig what I'm saying? And motherfuckers gonna always try to put that throw salt on the game, put a little bit of their opinion on shit, and try to flip you around and make you look like this, make you like the bad guy, make you like a criminal, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But they can't take away the real. They can't take away your legacy, man. They might be trying to delete it, but they can't take away the real. You know what I'm saying? Niggas gonna always know the real. You know what I'm saying? When we in the world where it's not that too many real niggas out here, you know what I'm saying? You gotta keep it real out here, you know what I'm saying? A lot of niggas out finna keep it real, you know what I'm saying? They, when pressure comes, they breaking, it's busting, pipe gone, you know what I'm saying? But one thing I can I give you about Fred Sanford, that nigga, I don't care what he, what, what he was going through, he knew how to make, get to the bread, and he didn't give a fuck about them taxes, you know what I'm saying? Which, unfortunately, was his downfall, you know what I'm saying? When, you know, when, 
The government, you know what I'm saying, see that you making a big bag off of the shit, of course they don't want that cut. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just natural. These motherfuckers don't want something of yours, and, but they don't want to help you out. You know what I'm saying? Like, they take, they can take all your money, take everything you got, but they don't want to help you out. They don't want to give you shit that you need to survive. You know what I'm saying? They're going to they turn you around. You try to get anything to get some food or some shit. They're going to turn that shit off. But they, but when they want, but they, when they want they money on, when the government want they money on, they getting that shit, nigga. They don't give a fuck, nigga. And when you want your your reputations or you want your shit that you that you got, they ain't, they ain't talking about none of that shit, nigga. You know what I'm saying? It's like a one man army. You know what I'm saying? Cause a lot of niggas not been talk the truth. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people can't talk the truth. That's the sad part. But it's like you know, a lot of niggas these days, man. We gotta figure out ways to you know what I'm saying come together. So shit like this won't happen. But I say he did put this. On his life a lot, you know what I'm saying? When you don't, when you, when it's strict shit, like they trying to say, hey, pay your shit, man, because they don't come and get your shit if you don't do what they do. They, you think the government and the IRS is playing games? The niggas, bro, they not. They take you out over little shit, nigga. They take you out over petty shit, nigga. Imagine you making big money in America, nigga. Of course, you, of course, you got an arrow on your back, nigga. So it's like you can't never think like, okay, I'm gonna dodge my luck this time, I'm gonna dodge my luck that time, I'm gonna do this and that. So I can try to, you know what I'm saying, get by and make the extra bucks. Yeah, you're gonna try to make the extra bucks and your ass gonna be fucked up at the end. But the thing about friends, Sacrament, when you keep it legit and you keep it like so fucking real, nigga, you it's just like niggas gonna help you just to help you. You know what I'm saying? Because you know they, they see the work you put in, they see how hard you go, they see all this, the shit you do, they ain't finna let you go out like that. You know what I'm saying? At least try to give you a chance, to, a fine chance to survive. You know what I'm saying? If you fuck up again, shit, hey, you know what I'm saying? Who knows? You might have some motherfuckers who might help you out again, but you never know, nigga. So, first time, man, he's just legit, man. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, you know when you legit, man, a lot of motherfuckers gonna see you as legit, man. And you can't let these motherfuckers, man, try to tell you, oh, Cause he like he did, he didn't make a little bad decision in his life, but you can't tell niggas, hey, if you do that, I don't think you're gonna win. Man, prove them niggas wrong. A lot of niggas not gonna believe in you. A lot of niggas not gonna support you. A lot of niggas gonna hate from the side. You know what I'm saying? That's just the truth. You know what I'm saying? So you gotta always do you believe what you believe. If you fail, hey, at least you went out there and tried, nigga. That's the truth, nigga. A lot of niggas ain't trying for shit, nigga. They just expect shit to happen. And when niggas try, they wanna laugh and shit. But then you, you, you know what I'm saying? When you fail, they laughing. But when you succeed, they like, wow. You know what I'm saying? So Fred Sapper is one of those niggas like, hey, you can come from nothing, nigga. You can have shit, nigga. You can be dirt fucking poor, nigga. And still turn out to be that nigga that you was supposed to be. And that's just the real nigga shit. Hey, man, say, man. I hope y'all enjoyed this video, man. Hey, Fresh Sanford, shout out to the legend. Unfortunately, he did die from a heart attack on his series, because, you know, that's one of his biggest moves. But, you know, hey, but how, good, how good does it feel to be your main shit that you go out to uh, and you actually die from it? That's like, damn, that's legend shit. That's legend status. But, hey, man, Sam, I hope y'all enjoyed this video, man. Um, Make sure y'all like and subscribe, and we will continue to do these videos. Hood and outside, crip shit, gang shit, for real. Hey, Dad, you know that when we link up, that this shit be legendary. You know this is instrumental, you the engineer on it, so. Hold that everywhere.